Vaughn Radio. My name is Julie Bueller. Thank you so much for being here. We're broadcasting live on Remnant Radio 100.1 FM and broadcasting live around the world on RadioRemnant.org. Thank you so much for being here. This show is dedicated to the family of faith around the globe, and it is good to have you on board because we have an awesome show planned for you. I want to just offer a big shout out though to our station ownership and this radio station here in the Coachella Valley. We're in Southern California. And again, this show goes across the globe and it's wonderful to come to this studio and feel at total peace and enjoy broadcasting the Word of God. And that's only possible because of station ownership. So I just wanted to thank Remnant Radio 100.1 FM for allowing this and of course, letting it go across the globe because this is exciting stuff. We want to get the word out because the human soul needs the word of God to survive for sure. Knowing the difference between truth and lies is the very key for us to be able to stand for the truth and then march forward in the victory that Christ attained for all of us that choose him. Now for generations, Satan has been on a campaign to deceive the masses really since the dawn of time. He's been feeding lie after lie after lie. That's his game. So we're going to expose it. We're going to throttle him today, actually. Yeah, a full throttling and expose these tactics and get people wise to how he operates. This is Christ speaking to the religious leaders of the day back in John chapter 8, verse 44. That's a clue too to how uh, Satan operates a lot of the times. So here's Christ speaking to the religious leaders of the day. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there's no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. All lies start in Satan's mouth, in his lips. He's a liar and he's the father of all lies. So as we learn the truth of God's word, we can stand on the truth of God's word and dispel the lies of Satan and walk in the fullness of God's truth and the fullness of God's eternal victory. So let's go back to the beginning. Um, as Christ says, you were a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. Let's go back to the beginning. This is Genesis 2, verse 17. It says, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. This is God Almighty speaking to Adam. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eats, eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Very simple and straightforward commandment of God. Okay, fast forward to Genesis 3, verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. He added only one word, changed the course of human history with a lie. Isn't that interesting? So today we are covering and exposing and throttling that loser, Satan, the eternal loser. He's a pathetic loser. He is. And he's a big fat liar. And we're going to expose the top three tactics that Satan uses to deceive people. And then a little bit later on, we have two incredible featured ministers that will further outline in the word how to retain this knowledge of God, how to retain it. It's so important. If we don't want to be deceived by these, this flood of lies that are out there, we need to retain the word of God in our souls. So we'll have our dear friend, Trish, explain that and offer the word in that regard. And then we have an incredible message, the difference between good and evil from our friend, Corey. So stay tuned. We have an awesome featured ministers that are very passionate about giving the truth of God's word in simplicity. And it's in, and it's in, in, in its totality as well. So the top three tactics of Satan that he uses to deceive people. Number one, slight alterations from God's word. So exhibit A is Adam and Eve. Now we'll hear a little, we'll hear a lot more of this actually in Corey's message about the difference between good and evil. But Satan infused one extra word, the word not, 
and changed everything. It was a very slight alteration, but it made a huge difference. Okay, that was at the beginning. Today, we have a very current example as well. Exhibit B, different translations of God's word. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now, most people, especially those who have been raised in churches, think this is the love chapter of the Bible. That's sort of accurate, but the problem is it's only sort of accurate. So let's read it. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. Paul, Apostle Paul speaking, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. This is the King James Version of the Bible, the only version of the Bible that is considered the authorized version. Okay? So it says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffers long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up doth not behave itself unseemly, seeks not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. So again, that is the King James Version of the Bible. It's not love, it's charity. Why is that so important? The King James Version of the Bible uses the word charity. In fact, it's mentioned 28 times in the King James Version of the Bible. And it's all the same definition in Greek. It's the word agape. You've probably heard that before, right? Now, the root of the word agape is love, affection, and benevolence. Beautiful. The word agape, though, actually means love feast. It's more than just love. It's a feast of love. And I was always taught charity is love in action. You've probably heard that too, right? Charity is love in action. As we're charitable, as we're doing the service of God, that's our love in action. So that's charity, but other translations, and I reviewed the top 15, the NIV, the Passion Translation, American Standard, Darby, and many more. They all replace the word charity with the word love. Even the new King James Version even the New King James Version, which supposedly just replaces the these and the thous to make it, uh, the language a little bit more modern. Even the New King James Version replaced the word charity with the word love. So what's the big deal, you might be wondering? We do need love. God is love. That's wonderful. The big deal is that all those other translations took the action out of the word charity, took the feast out of the word charity and just put love in there. You see the problem with that? All these new translations took the King James Version and deactivated the very essence of the Christian walk, charity. So yeah, there's a good reason to stick to the original, the authorized version, and that's the reason we do here on Get Your Love On. Did you know that? What else are we missing out on if we, don't, if we don't have the King James Version of the Bible? That's one little example. But it, it, if you extrapolate that across the entire Word of God, what other feasts of knowledge or wisdom or God's love are people missing out on because of the convenience factor or because of the modernization of language factor? It's BS. It's Satan's number one tactic. Slight alterations of the word of God. Changes everything. Changes everything. In this instance, it takes the action out of the Christian walk. So people are walking around and in their heart, they're loving their neighbor. That's wonderful. Paul says if you're not putting action behind it, you're a tinkling symbol. Nothing. That's the difference, my beloved friends. So that's why Satan wants to hide this. He wants all these translations to seem like, oh, they're all good. They'll give it to you in part, but not the whole. 
well, I don't want to miss out on anything that God has for me. And I hope you don't either. I hope you want it all too, because God wants us to have it all. He says it is his good pleasure to give us the kingdom. So let's feast on it. Let's enjoy that feast of love that is charity. Let's enjoy the feast of wisdom and knowledge and graciousness that God intends for us through his authorized version, through his word. Isn't that wonderful to know now? Isn't that wonderful to know? And I'm so grateful that the Lord has given us this knowledge. And again, that's one example. I'd encourage you to get a King James Version of the Bible and start reading through it. And you'll see for yourself. But let's take action. Let's make sure we don't miss out on anything that God has for us. So if we're not reading the King James Version, what are we getting? What other alterations have been made without our knowledge or that are seemingly insignificant? So what if it's a synonym? It's a big deal. It's a big difference. Big difference. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 8. This is Paul speaking, Apostle Paul. And this is the stance here that our entire team here at Get Your Love On makes. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. (laughs) That's right. We will speak the truth, God's truth, from the word all the time. Nothing wavering, no alterations, just the simple word of God. Because it's perfect and complete and whole. And I love the Lord for that. Yeah, we can do nothing against the truth. God's word stands forever. And it's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Another reason to stick with the King James Version. But I think I've made my point there, so let's move on. Okay, so number one tactic is slight alterations of God's word. Number two, Satan actually tries to change the definition of words with our modern language. So there's a few notable examples, but I'll use one um, from the word of God. Because it's very illustrative of how destructive this tactic is. Slight alterations of God's word? Well, let's also change the English language. So uh, here's a study I did on the word meek. And this is actually available on the podcast. The show is called The Strength in True Meekness. You can listen to the whole study. I don't have time to get into it today, but I will give you the Cliff Notes version because meekness is an incredible gift of the Spirit. And Moses and Christ were both called meek in the Word of God. This is an incredible compliment. And meekness is something we all want in our life. If we're to be, as we get closer to God, we become more and more meek. We become more and more Christ-like. So meekness is a great compliment. In Numbers 12, 3, it says, Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. And in Matthew 11, verse 29, it says, Take my yoke upon you. This is Christ speaking. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. So it's wonderful to be meek. And in in the Greek, when Christ is speaking, that word means mild, gentle, and humble. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, you just feel, yes, I want to be meek, Lord. Show me how to become more meek. Okay, that's, that's great. So what's interesting, though, is the slow uh, transition from the word meek that used to mean soft and gentle, as it does in the Greek as Christ meant it. And then it changed through Middle English to mean courteous or indulgent. Huh. Well, that's an odd way of looking at it because we don't indulge the flesh. Never. And then if you just Google meek, um, if you look it up in Webster's, it means the first definition is enduring injury with patience and without resentment, mild. That's a correct definition. Thank you, Webster, for getting the first one right. But interestingly enough, the example that Webster uses here, again, this is just Webster.com, the example is, quote, a meek child dominated by his brothers. Whoa, that kind of gives you the wrong impression of the word meek. Um, And then the second definition is deficient in spirit and courage, submissive. Excuse me? 
No. Uh, Christ is not deficient in spirit or courage and uh, does not submit to the ways of this world. Nope. And then the third definition, and again, this is how Satan, this is a, a tactic of Satan. He changes the definition of the words. So when Christ was speaking, he's saying, I am meek and lowly of heart. He means gentle and mild and humble. Now the word meek, according to Webster's, means deficient in spirit and courage or not violent or not strong. <laughs> wow. That's the exact opposite of the word of God. Now, interestingly enough, in 1913, you can access the meaning of words from 1913 too. If you go to Webster's1913.com, it's a much, if you want to understand the true English language, this is a much better reference for you. It means mild of temper, correct, not easily provo provoked or irritated, patient under injuries, not vain or haughty or resentful, invincing mildness of temper or patience characterized by mildness or patience. So back in 1913, they actually got it right. But today, not so much. Now, if you look at the synonyms, and again, a synonym is a word that it has this supposedly is interchangeable with the word meek. <laughs> this is going to boil some blood because again, Christ says, I am meek and lowly in heart. So if you don't have access to a concordance and you can't look up the original translation of the word in the Greek and you just Google it, you're, you're going to be really led astray here because it supposedly the synonyms are, quote, nothing. Well, don't confuse the word meek with the word meager. We do not serve a meager God. Oh, no. In, Fe in Ephesians 3.20, it says, Now unto him, speaking of God, that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Okay, we're Christians. We're walking in the fullness of the Holy Spirit in Christ. We've got power in us. That's not nothing. That's everything. You see the problem with this? You see, you see the tactic of Satan here in changing the definition of the word meek? Because it's such a compliment. It's something we all want. Yeah. Other synonyms, according to now, this is thesaurus.com. Synonyms, quote, spineless, quote, spiritless, unresisting, weak, weak need, wishy-washy, zero. No, that is all false. This, these are lies. These are not synonyms to the true word meek. Not at all. No, let's, uh, let's check out our meek and lowly Savior, Jesus Christ. This is John 2. Let's go to verse 13. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables. And said unto them that sold doves, take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. <laughs> That's our meek Lord. Strong, powerful, stands for righteousness. Get this stuff out of here. We're doing the same thing to all of Satan's tactics and his lies. We're exposing them. And you get to make, now, now we all get to be wiser and understand better. We get to understand what's true meekness. That's Christ. Christ is meek and lowly of heart. That's not a weak-kneed, uh, wishy-washy, spineless person. No, he's strong and powerful. And he gives that sta same strength and power to each one of us. And yes, we get to be meek as well and lowly of heart and compassionate to those who have been fed lies and need the truth of God's word. So we'll keep giving it to you. We'll keep pouring it out. As long as you're wanting to hear it, we will be here giving you the truth of God's word. That's what we're here to do. So the man that rescued the Israelites from the Egyptians and the man that rescued all mankind by enduring the cross and then resurrecting from the dead, they were both meek. And yet the authorities, quote unquote, of language today say the word meek supposedly is along the lines of spineless, weak, or wishy-washy. 
Are you getting wiser? Are we all getting wiser? Yeah, this is a tactic of Satan. If he doesn't, if he can't just change God's word because we're in our word and we know it, so we don't listen to that, he'll try to change the definition of language. So again, let's stick with the King James Version of the Bible. Let's get it, read it, and know it, and believe it. Matthew 5.5 5 says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So certainly we, we want to be meek, but never wishy-washy, never spineless, never um, spiritless. Mm -mm, we're full of spirit. <laughs> Very much so. Don't you love, don't you love the truth of God's word getting out? Don't you love it? It's so exciting. It's so wonderful. Okay, so the first tactic of Satan is slight alterations of God's word. The second tactic is just changing the English language and the definitions thereof. The third tactic that we're going to cover, oops, excuse my hitting of the mic. The third tactic is calling things that are good, bad, and calling things that are evil, good or acceptable, or okay. <laughs> All right, well, let's get into this. This one's this one is getting exposed, and it'll be exposed uh, in, in great detail as well for the rest of the show, too. So here are some, well, let's go to Isaiah 520 first. Because again, Satan tries to present himself as smart and cunning. No, he's been doing the same tired tactics since the beginning of time, he convinced Eve, and he's hoping to use the same lies. So as we expose his lying ways, we get to stand in the truth of God's word. And he fails. But again, he tries to act like these things are new, and he's so smart and cunning. He's not. He's a pathetic loser who lost for all eternity when Christ resurrected. And loses every time we speak out the truth. He is getting his butt beat today so hard. <laughs> And I love it. Thank you, Lord. The Lord made that possible. Through Jesus Christ's ultimate victory, we get to crush Satan every single day. Yep, we sure do. We get to crush his lies. We get to stomp all over them. We get to tell him what a pathetic loser he is. Because <laughs> he is. So we get to speak that truth. Yep, he's getting hammered today. Okay, Isaiah 520. It says, Woe unto them that call evil good, and good evil evil that put darkness for light and light for darkness that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter confusion chaos muddying the waters that's a tactic of satan and god is the opposite he's very direct simple and steady the same yesterday today and forever Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your righteousness and thank you for your stances. Love it. Okay, so here are some very, I'm, gonna, I'm going to go over two very common lies that are just flung around there that do this, that call good things bad and bad things good. Okay, these are very common lies that are tossed around with ease in common discourse and they're actually lies of the devil. And they're intended to separate the human soul from the love of God, from their creator. So let's watch out. Let's get our ears tuned. Let's be very wise. Now, one of the top lies, and this just hit me recently. One of the top lies that Satan uh, gets out there is, quote, the truth hurts. <laughs> nope, that's a lie. The truth sets you free. Yeah, it doesn't hurt. Maybe someone's opinion hurts. Maybe having to look at the past, yeah, that can be painful. That can give you an ouch to the flesh. Sure. But there is nothing about the truth that hurts. It's the opposite. It sets you free. It's freeing. It's wonderful to know the truth. There's nothing painful about it. It's beautiful and liberating. Yes, we should seek the truth with all our heart. But if that lie is going out there, oh, the truth hurts. <laughs> If that lie is going out there, then people will not seek the truth. You see why that's such a damaging lie? So here in John chapter 8, verse 31, it says, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. 
and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Isn't that wonderful? As we follow Christ, as we believe him, then, then we will know the truth. Yeah, we will. That's what's happening right now. It's going out across this land, broadcasting internationally. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> and, it, and you shall know the truth. That's a promise of God. You won't be left in the dark. He gives us the truth as we keep his commandments, as we seek him, as we believe him. You're going to hear more on that a little bit later on. And the truth shall make you free. Very direct, very simple, very secure. That's wonderful. Thank you, Lord. And then further on in verse 36, this is really important. It says, if the son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Now, why does it say if right there? It's because that son, S, capital S, O, N, is Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the son of God. And there are other Jesuses in the Bible. There's Bar Jesus, who's actually a sorcerer, and there's Jesus Justice, who's a righteous man. But if you're just saying the name of Jesus, you got to be more specific than that. It's the Son of God, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. If he is making you free, you are free indeed. If there's something else that you think you're free under, you're actually not really free. That's what that, that's what that means. The only way to be truly free is through Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And if it's through him, then yep, for sure, you are free indeed. Isn't that great? So yes, when we believe on Jesus Christ of Nazareth, he shall, we shall know the truth. We shall be set free by the truth. So no way does the truth hurt. Opinions might. Having to face the past might. But the truth doesn't. No. The truth sets us free. John 4, 14, 6 Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Isn't that? Thank you, Lord. Again, he is the truth. So we need him. The truth doesn't hurt. <laughs> it sets us free. <laughs> That's a lie. So let's expose it. Let's, and, and if we hear someone say that, let's offer them the truth of the word. No, 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 no. The truth doesn't hurt. It says, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free in the word of God. So it doesn't hurt. It sets us free. We want the truth in our life. We want it. Matthew 11. How much more is this truth freeing? It says, Matthew 11, verse 28. This is Christ speaking again. And Christ is the truth. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. <laughs> yeah, Believing lies, hearing lies even, is very laborious and you, it, it's heavy. It's, it weighs a soul down to be surrounded by lies. So come unto Christ and he will give us rest. It says in verse 29, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and shall, ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. <laughs> it's not hard to be a Christian. It's not hard. It's easy and it's light. It's freeing to know the truth of God. Isn't that neat? I love you, Lord. Thank you so much for this. We're exposing Satan's tactics and we're just taking a wrecking ball right through all of them. Isn't this fun? It's really fun. Okay, Acts 2 verse 37. This is a good one. How easy is this yoke? Well, Acts 2, verse 37. A bunch of people just found out about Christ. They are coming unto him. And they're saying, what shall we do? How do we get that rest that Christ is talking about? And this is Apostle Peter. I'm sorry, in verse 37, these are uh, the men and brethren. It says, now when they heard this, all this, these multitudes, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? How do we obtain this rest? There have been lies in our life. How do we, how are we set free in the truth of God's word? It says, then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, 
even as many as the Lord our God shall call. It's very easy. The truth is freeing and light and incredible to know. It's, it's the very lifeblood that we walk in victory with. We can't walk in victory if we believe that the truth hurts because Christ is the truth. So you see how that puts you on uneven playing field, uneven stance? If, if it, how can his yoke be easy and his burden is light if it hurts? Because <laughs> it doesn't. That's a lie. The truth does not hurt. It sets us free. Okay, another big lie. We're exposing these lies, these, these lies. And I'm only, this is just scratching the surface. Because again, this has been going on for generation, generation after generation after generation. We were scratching the surface, but I'm, I hope we're all getting a lot wiser today and a lot more um, aware and sharp. This is sharpening us all. It's wonderful. This is really neat. So Satan's tactics are to call good things bad and bad things good. Send out these lies. Okay. So one of them is that the truth hurts. Well, we just expose that for being exactly what it is. A big fat lie. The second one, this one's really, um, it's everywhere and you have to watch it because people just say it. They just pop it out, but it's a lie. And the word, the it's only two words. Nobody's perfect. That's a lie. You want to, you want me to prove it to you? So I have three brothers and they're all married. All have been married more than a decade and all three of my brothers. And I've watched these marriages for actually one of them for two decades plus. I've watched these marriages closely. All three of my brothers will announce freely and regularly. My wife is perfect. They do all the time. And isn't that wonderful? Now who would say, no, she's not. No, she's not. No one would. No one reasonable anyway. No, we love, we rejoice that a husband would say that about his wife, right? That's love. That's what that means, that he loved, my brothers love their wives so much. And my father says, says this about my mother too. You're, my wife's perfect. Well, yeah, that's their perspective. And they love them. So that's perfect. That's wonderful that they say that. I think we would all, we all rejoice to hear that, right? Nobody's trying to, uh, nobody would go up to my brother and be like, nope, nobody's perfect. No, that, that person, if they did, that would be a total jerk, right? Well, God sees us as perfect. When we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we have his spirit inside us. He sees us as perfect. That's his perspective, God's perspective. So why would we care about anyone else's perspective? Why would we believe nobody's perfect? When in Deuteronomy 18, 13, it says, thou shalt be perfect with the Lord, thy God. Yeah. As we accept Christ and we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we'll hear more about that a little bit later on. We are perfect with God. The word perfect means complete and whole. We're not lacking anything. So again, it's God's perspective. Who is man to try to dispute that? If my brother came up to you and said, my wife's perfect, wouldn't you rejoice in that? Well, can't we rejoice when God says, you beloved, beloved child of mine are perfect. Want more? How about Matthew 5, 48? God says, be, ye, this is Christ speaking, be ye therefore perfect, even as your father, which is in heaven is perfect. Be complete and whole with God. Again, confirming Deuteronomy 18, 13. It's very simple. <laughs> But again, Satan puts that lie out there, nobody's perfect, to hurt the human soul, to separate us from God's love. Wouldn't that hurt my brother, any one of them, and there's three of them, they're all incredible men of God. Wouldn't that hurt my brother if he, if he says, my wife's perfect, and someone comes up and says, no, nope, nobody's perfect. Yeah, that would hurt. And I mean, he's a strong man, he wouldn't put up with that, and we shouldn't put up with anyone telling us our soul is not perfect before God. When we do what Apostle Peter lays out in Acts 2.38, we repent, we're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and we receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Beloved friends, we are perfect in God's eyes. Who, what other opinion can possibly matter? 
Not a one. No ones. James 1.4 says, But pa let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Yeah, we need to have patience. And again, that word perfect in the word just in the Bible means complete and whole. Yep, doesn't mean that there's, there is no evaluation of the outward appearance. It's an inward man that is being called perfect. Nothing on the outside, nothing of the flesh, all about the spirit of God inside us. And when we have that, we are perfect. Yes, thank you, Lord. It's in the word. I believe God. I hope you do too. Let's do that. Let's believe God for everything in his word. Let's go to 2 Timothy 3, 16. It says here, All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and all is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Isn't that beautiful? Thank you, Lord. Sure appreciate. See, we need the word of God. We need to believe it. We need to do it. And then the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Well, I hope this has helped. I hope that this has exposed the top three tactics of Satan. Number one, slight alterations of the word of God. Number two, just outright changing the definition of words. And number three, sending out these popularized lies. Listen, keep your ears open, tune, and be aware of the lies that are going out there and stand for the truth. Now that we're wise to Satan's tactics, his manipulation of language, we can watch for it and we can stand for righteousness and we can stand for God because he'll back us up 100% of the time. And I can say this for myself, certainly. And I can also say this for this incredible, faithful, wonderful woman of God. She's a true minister, a beautiful prophet, and someone that was raised in the word by a true apostle. And I thank God that he has preserved a remnant of faithful people who can't be bought, who won't bow their knee, so that we can hear the truth. Because it's so rare. And what we are about to hear is incredibly rare knowledge and equally as marvelous and wonderful. You're going to hear a very fervent minister offer each one of us, whose ears are open, the proper roadmap. So let's get ready to be blessed with the love, joy, and peace of God's Holy Spirit. This message is by our friend, Trish.